Hi, everybody. So I heard a bunch of talks today. People just shamelessly show their own project. And I very idealistically decided to talk about something actually useful. So, um, so collective engineering. So actually what happened yesterday was that I was asked a question about why now is this happening? And, and then I heard myself give an answer and I thought, I have to change this entire presentation now. And I didn't. But I'm going to, going to do something different from what I intended. Um, and I'll just wing it with the slides. So let me ask you four questions. And I want to hear, see hands um, from people who agree with the statement, right? So first statement, robots are coming. Who agrees with that? OK. Second statement, robots are already here. Okay, third statement, robots will enslave us. Statement number four, robots have already enslaved us. <laughs> so, so the reason why all of this is happening that I'm going to talk about, and the reason why it's so important, is coming from the fact that actually, when we started building software, you know, roughly 60s, 70s, then it kind of ramped up in the 80s with personal computers and, you know, ramped even higher up with the web. We thought about computers as our slaves. Okay? Well, guess what? <laughs> At this point in time, the function that computers solve and the purpose that the data that is they store solves is so critical that, in fact, our lives are completely dependent on how well it functions. And, you know, they don't have to be intelligent uh, in order to be our slave masters. And so what I'm going to talk about is a new profession uh, that I have coined, and feel free to repeat it on every corner, that I call collective engineering. Um, whose idea is to rethink the way, or rather, to provide the <clears throat> mechanism for how digital um, systems interact with human systems. And so on this slide, I put a uh, target there where the, this, this discipline belongs. It's right in between the dry and formal worlds of computers and the kind of informal and fluid worlds of human beings. And it's a very multidisciplinary field. You really have to be. You have to be both an engineer and a psychologist, which I modestly tend to be, <laughs> uh, in order to actually do this work and in order to um, uh, kind of be effective. It combines things like user experience, user interface, economics, cognitive science, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very interesting multidisciplinary field. Um, it's not new. Uh, we have done uh, socio-technical systems before. Wikipedia is an extremely successful example, uh, as is Kickstarter. I both see them, see them as uh, collective engineering systems because they were able to scale uh, while actually tr transforming uh, human behavior. They're, they're a human computer system coevolution. Both are quite successful. Both use uh, economics. Uh, phase, uh, sorry, Wikipedia is, is a really unique approach to economics. No economics. And Kickstarter is uh, you know, getting people into groups, uh, which is a very simple but effective idea. What is the, what's happening right now is that as we're going to computers as slave masters, we can no longer afford human operators to be in charge. This, to me, what decentralization actually means. Uh, it means humans are no longer in charge. And the problem is that humans are quite effective at a bunch of things. Uh, but if you take them away from being in charge, the question is who fulfills the roles that humans were so good at fulfilling before including things like recourse, governments, quality assurance, support, etc. 
Um, and that creates a ton of complexity because now when you're decentralized, when there's no single party that can fill the role of supporter or problem resolver, you have to get all these other guys to come in and do this work for you. And sometimes they don't have enough skin in the game. There's many of them. The complexity of the system increases quite sharply. Most of my talk, if you are to take away one point, is that the most important thing in decentralized uh, systems is complexity management. And this is one slide that tells you about it. Um, because, <laughs> and, and I'm, you know, welcome uh, you to ask Mike about the mathematical details uh, of various kinds of socio-technical systems. I'm going to talk at the very high level. Also, I'm going to give very few answers. I'm mostly going to outline the problem because to me, you can't actually have good answers if you haven't understood the problem and the... I find that this problem is very broadly misunderstood. So the fact that you don't have an op operator anymore creates a rather unique pains in uh, decentralized systems. Um, and I listed here six topics that um, into which the pains fall. They're all inevitably related to the fact that the operator is no longer there. It all comes back to that. And there, the problem of credential management that has to do with the user being inevitably completely sloppy with their passwords and stuff. Governance problem, because governance is uh, most importantly about decisions that in situations that you haven't thought of before. Uh, recourse, because occasionally bad things do happen. Um, agility, because everything always changes and who decides how to change a certain thing. Incentive design, because that's how we drive the human beings and how we enslave them, so that's really important. And then oracles that solve for data accuracy problem, which, by the way, is a whole... Each of these four are a huge amount of um, art and science in, in, in their own rights. Um, the data quality problem before decentralization comes in the form of fake news and stuff like that. So let's go through them one by one, and I'm going to outline some questions. Uh, and the first one I'm going to talk about is credentials management. Um, I'm going to use Dilbert as a speaker for my, <laughs> for my topic. Um, the current state of credential management uh, is pretty pathetic. Uh, we heard a lot about this today because this generally falls into the uh, area related to identity. Uh, at the technology level, identity kind of translates to credential management. Um, we are, as is, completely confused with credential management, and now we're trying to complicate it even further by the fact that we're removing the operator uh, as somebody who can actually help us restore access if we lose it. Not that Facebook would ever actually take a phone call, granted. So it's not really new. Um, but um, the current state is fairly complicated, and at least in principle, operator is a kind of a catch-all for all the problems. Um, in the decentralized world, things become quite hairy, because a credential in the decentralized world is, you know, not your keys, not your Bitcoin. Everybody heard that. So basically, um, the problem is that the naive view is that by removing control of your keys uh, from the operator and putting it into your personal hands, we claim um, that the system becomes more secure. The truth is it's kind of the opposite because um, it's only more secure for people who know how to be secure, and those are actually in the minority. Um, if you are building a decentralized credential management, a system that requires credentials, and, and the, you know, then you, you actually have to think of usability of that as a, as a security question. 
usability is intrinsically connected to security because if something is not usable and it's not easy to understand, it will never be secure. And let's see. Yes, um, this is one example. Thanks, Josh, for pointing it out to me. Um, this happened. Um, I especially like that last one. <laughs> this, is, this is, you know, a fairly intelligent individual who just has disclosed that he, he had used, you know, nine nines as his password for his wallet. Um, so that happens. Um, and that is just because, you know, people don't think in security terms. And you really, really have to make sure to kind of navigate that line between security and ease of use, otherwise you're kind of screwed. Um, so collective engineering insight, uh, you know, I kind of summarized the question and the problem. Uh, so I already went through most of this. Um, with security, it's, it's really complicated. And that to me is a key research question. I have no answer. I'm working on something that might eventually come up with it. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are working on that. And it's really critical for uh, collective engineering of decentralized systems. Um, recourse. So the idea of recourse is that there will always be situations where something bad will happen and will need to be fixed. So somebody gets screwed, somebody, you know, I was just reading the Vice um, articles on uh, kind of Airbnb getting again to the next scaling point where uh, people are saying, well, Airbnb is not supporting us, we had a really bad experience. Um, so some people might kind of disagree with me um, about the need for recourse. In general, I think if a system is to be um, viable for very large markets of consumers, you, you kind of have to have recourse, I think, my, my personal view. And that is because um, there will always be a, ways, a way to do something bad that you can't predict almost impossible to fix in software because it's all in the wet world of people. I say, say this, you say this, I, did, did say, I sent you the package, I didn't receive the package. Somebody has to sometimes go and figure it out. Um, there are simple solutions that go, you know, 80% there, but, but eventually, um, in some cases, you have to uh, think about this. Uh, insurance being alternative to recourse is a very interesting topic because in many cases uh, all recourse kind of boils down to purely financial um, damage and in that case this might be one interesting thing to think about. Uh, these are the needs for, um, uh, f this is why we need recourse. Um, you know, the, the s several topics on um, you know, from my kind of, from here, um, kind of come very close together. Credential management, governance, recourse, and agility, you know, you can't think of one without the other. Um, so when you say, when I say here, no set of rigid rules will ever be complete, you know, it might be a problem for recourse or for governance or for change management. They're very related because they all have to do with human decision making. And incidentally, how you integrate human decision making with a technology system is probably one of the biggest questions here. Uh, one funny example uh, from, um, from decentralized um, insanity, uh, which I really like. This is an actual conversation. Um, Um, so, a lot of people default to um, collective decision making um, in order to provide recourse or governance. This is great, um, you know, but also decision making is uh, a really big topic, sorry, 
Uh, there is a big book called uh, Handbook of Computational Social Choice. It's probably about this thick, and it's like you know a few hundred megabytes online. You can download it, um, and it's a kind of a bible on um, um, collective choice and various models, including various kinds of voting and mathematical analysis of them. So it's a big um, it's a big topic. Um, that um, that is kind of outside of the scope here, but but we know we have already seen uh, situations where naive um, models of collective decision making, decentralized system, basically don't work. I'll talk about it a little more when I talk about governance. Um, and you know, one of the issues is that it's really a really new field. Uh, and we have not played with it enough. Um, you know, traditional governance models have a few thousand year old history. This is barely coming alive. So, and again, complexity is a huge problem because uh, when you try to combine together all the factors, uh, all the data, all the behaviors that come from the digital system with all the things that humans do, in the process of uh, such a complicated uh, decision-making mechanism, uh, it, they create a lot of complexity. So, and the key research question is who watches the watchman? Because if we are to eliminate the operator and, and then we are to install a different body to make those human-level decisions around these systems, then how do we make sure that that body is actually doing the right thing? Does that make sense? And, you know, this is all really related. It all comes together to the topic of human decision making, so it's generally very similar. Um, the need for governance comes from all of these factors that I've just talked about. Um, and most important, explanation for why you need that is because you can never fully describe all the rules that the system um, you can never fully describe all the rules of a system and you can never they, they can never be final so there has to be some process by which these rules change and and new things happen and how things happen outside of the rules that you've set up um, and if you read, uh, lit, you know, political literature on governance, the best governance models will always have a mechanism for exception handling. Um, so now I've removed the operator, but I'm now talking about governance. Um, that's a bit of a contradiction. Well, we kind of don't know what to do there, but I, th but, but I think the general consensus is you're not removing the operator, you're removing an operator that is unilateral. You're, you're replacing a, an easily corruptible entity with a group that by some process um, makes decisions together. Um, without there being a way to, you know, buy it or influence it too much. We hope that we can do it. It's not clear that we can. Um, nothing that I've seen being proposed in the area of decentralized governance um, I see as quite completely immune from being corrupted. Um, so on one hand, we have the need to make decisions outside of the formal rules. On the other hand, we have a problem that most of those decisions, most of those mechanisms do instill too much power in, in, in some group of people or another. Um, the way you solve that is sometimes with incentives by making sure that the people who are tasked with the process uh, of making these decisions are aligned with, with the general purpose of the system. Um, but it's very hard to achieve this. And, and, and I, I think it's going to be a while before we have actually built and proven in the field, field something that's actually stable. Um, 
Some people may say we can get away without it, but I personally don't really believe it. I think we need it. Um, and a case study, I, I put voting as a case study because voting is where people go um, by default. Uh, and that's because they haven't read that book. So I highly recommend that anybody working on actual digital governance must read. I wish there was a like a, like a sound file of a large tome slapping on the table because that's what I want to do with everybody who comes to me with like, hey, I'm working on governance. I would send them that file and then the link to this book. Um, but voting is, is a very naive way to make decisions. First of all, nobody actually believes that it will lead to good decisions. Uh, game theory of voting is that it's better for a rational actor to not vote than to vote. Yes, that's true. Um, participation has actually been really low in uh, blockchain-based voting systems. If you look from, at all of them, starting with the DAO and going on to uh, the, the current DAO-based voting systems, you'll see that the number of people that, that actually pay attention generally tends to be extremely low. Um, it immediately frustrates you because uh, there's very, very little ways in which you feel effective in, in a system like that. Um, and of course, the one thing that people rarely talk about is that for truly critical decisions, you have to eliminate a way to buy votes, and that is much harder than you think. The whole reason why uh, election technology in, in many places is still on paper is actually because that's one of the ways to prevent uh, buying votes. It's a very interesting topic because the moment you can prove to somebody how you voted, uh, the votes can be bought. So any system where the votes cannot be bought has to prevent you from being able to prove how you voted, which is kind of the opposite from what the voting system actually is supposed to do. It's very tricky. Uh, yeah, and I don't even know where to begin. The other thing about all these, uh, and Jamie was just uh, actually mentioning that, is that uh, in decentralized systems, um, you know, the naive approach is, well, we build it, it will work. And with, for, for somebody who has, you know, like, like I do, 15 years of experience building and running actual computer systems in the wild, um, all systems change, um, and they have to be changed because sometimes you discover things you haven't thought about, and sometimes the environment in which the system is running has changed. So uh, change management is critical, and I've seen surprisingly few, none, uh, actually, I haven't seen uh, decentralized or like blockchain platforms that talk about that. Like nobody start prefaces their white paper by saying, well, this is what we think is going to be happening tomorrow, but three days from now, if we need to make a change, this is how we'll do it. You, you're not going to find that in the white paper. Um, I find that kind of ridiculous. Um, so, and then of course, change is a huge power if your system is running something critical. So again, the question is who should have that power and how are those decisions made, which is, goes back to the question of governance. Let's talk about change. Change is not, um, change is not a trivial thing. Um, I talk about three kinds of change. Uh, when I think about change. And incremental change, small change in systems behavior, you know, you make, you know, a, an, an Ethereum virtual machine instruction work a little faster, that's a small incremental change, that's easy. Radical change, deep risky, uh, you, you're changing something very fundamental about the system. So, you know, again, from the Ethereum world, um, The Ethereum's change from proof of work to proof of stake, for example, is, is, is a radical change. And then there is disruptive change. And the difference between radical change and disruptive change is very subtle. 
the disruptive change uh, is one that affects the behavior of people, not just software. Uh, and I have an exercise. Who here actually remembers the DAO fork on Ethereum? A couple of people? Oh, very nice. So, incremental, radical, or disruptive? The DAO fork. It's a change. Huh? Who here thinks radical? Who here thinks disruptive? Disruptive. Why? Because it changed the social contract of the, of the Ethereum blockchain. The social contract before the DAO fork was code is law. Huh? Um, then, of so so going um, going back to kind of the broader topic that I started with, collective engineering. Um, so previously, I was talking about all the reasons why there is complexity in this area. So now I'm going to shift, uh, talk a little bit about incentives. And again, Zargam here is a king of incentive uh, design and uh, simulation. Um, but we are emerging into the world where I think for the first time in, in the entirety of history, we can go to your, you can go to your garage and design an incentive system. I mean, for a while, it, could have, could, it could be done, you know, kings could do it, you know, one person out of a million. Before then, it would arise uh, organically in you know, various social structures. But, but now, you can actually go to your garage and design an incentive system with smart contracts and ERC-20 tokens or something similar. Uh, and of course, a lot of people did that in 2017. The primary reason was fundraising. But also, you know, the original thesis behind uh, incentives designed in your garage uh, is to, for example, drive user acquisition to create rewards for early adopters. One of the solutions to the whole uh, consortia paradox is that actually it's not hard to start a consortia. You just have to give the first, the first organization to join the most amount of money. Uh, and the second one a little less, and the third one a little less, and then eventually they pile up and they try to kind of push you away. It's a little bit of a joke, but incentive design is really powerful. It can solve uh, a lot of a, a, a different kinds of coordination problems in, in this kind of roundabout way. Um, so these are all the reasons why <coughs> incentives are really important and wh why they're used. Um, if you remember the second slide, I'm not going to rewind back to that. but. You know, in a system that has so many different uh, players and counterparties, incentive design is what kind of holds them together. So, so it's really critical. Uh, and that's because, you know, robots need to incentivize human behavior. Um, and that's why. And, and so... Um, <clears throat> The problem with incentives designed in software, though, is also, just like with governance and everything, everything else, are very subtle. One of the big problems that I see is, and especially I've seen it in the early days of blockchain uh, and back when I was still advising people, somebody come, comes to me and says, oh, we'll solve the fake news problem by incentivizing people to tell the truth. <laughs> and I'm like, okay... <laughs> How are you going to do that? We're like, we're going to pay them for real news. It's like, how are you going to know it's real? <laughs> you know, this, this stuff happens. You know, people could be that naive. Um, when you are integrating a, a digital formal world of data with an informal world of human beings and information and the communication that flows between them, you have to realize that there is a major disconnect between them from the start. And that is 
computers only react to signal, whereas people sometimes react to substance. Your system is being designed for substance, but the only thing that your computer can do is interpret a signal. And the difference between a substance and, and a signal is that a signal can always be forged. And substance is incredibly um, subjective. So navigating between the objectivity and the subjectivity, the, the data and the information, the signal and the substance, is incredibly hard. So an example here is lines of code is a signal, but whether those lines are good or not is the substance, right? So whenever, again, this has happened multiple times, people came and said, we're going to incentivize open source by, you know, rewarding the best developers, but who decides who is best, right? You have to somehow use the human to figure that out, but then who, who do you trust, right? Um, so that's really hard. Um, <clears throat> In incentive design, one of the really big problems we have observed, observed many times is the problem of uh, speculative up-down volatility in assets, which sometimes completely breaks the economic model of the system. Um, the first and the second questions here are related because if the fundamental value is accurately reflected, then you don't have speculative volatility. And then... Um, Again, Zargam the King will tell you how to avoid nasty economic edge cases. Um, um, very similar problem. Um, the next problem in the line, the last one, is the data quality problem. Um, and, and that is also related to the signal versus um, substance question. Because how do you ensure that data uh, that the system collects um, is actually usable for the system to do whatever it is designed to do with that data. Um, we can easily make it self-consistent inside the system, but they're all garbage in, garbage out. So if you put something that's not true uh, into the system, it will actually not do what you want. Um, and so... The data supply problem for a decentralized system, you know, it's been talked about. It's not a, it's not a mis it's not a, it's a, it's a recognized problem, and we call it the Oracle problem. Um, the one big issue here is that data inputs are honeypots because if you wanted to steal a bunch of value from the system, you can very often do it by supplying the system with the wrong data. Um, you can kind of mislead the robot to uh, do what you want it to do. Um, so it's not just probabilistic, it's actually a security problem. So an Oracle uh, is a data supplier into decentralized systems. And the biggest issue with, um, with oracles is how do you create trustworthy behavior and how do you make decentralized oracle reliable? Um, I'm not going to talk here about decentralized oracles, but um, they've been experimented with in various Ethereum-based um, projects. And it's very interesting to see uh, an occasional fluke that happens, so somebody I forget the exact thing that happened, but, but somebody was using a token curated registry, which is basically one form of the oracles. And because people were not paying attention, somebody was able to commit that information to it, just as an experiment. Um, general comments and closing. <laughs> um, as I said, uh, complexity is key. Um, and complexity management is what we're here to learn about. We're not here to learn about finance. We're not here to learn about, you know, supply chain. We're here to learn about complexity management. Um, agility, relatedly, uh, 
is okay. I like how I wrote it on the slide. Scalability of decentralized systems mostly depend on agility, not on the number of transactions per second. If you can process a million transactions per second, but you can't process the one transaction you just realized you should have in your system, you're screwed. So when we talk about agility, uh, sorry, when we talk about scalability, don't believe what people are saying about scalable blockchain. Um, uh, oh, wow, it's a typo. <laughs> it's just hilarious. This is supposed to read, if your system is not being adopted, it must be that the user is stupid. <laughs> wow, I should have catched that one. Um, uh, this was me trying to be sarcastic, uh, and I did study clown theater in the past. Um, <laughs> um, when we offer, the, the whole point of decentralization is that we are offering users a new level of control over what happens um, through these types of systems. Control over their data, control over their finance, control over their decisions. Um, if you offer them that new level of control, how can we support them to actually take the responsibility that comes with that control? Um, because that is what is blocking adoption of decentralized systems today. I'm a firm believer in that. And in closing, I think that's my <laughs> biggest takeaway. Uh, wow, I did amazing on time. Uh, we have six minutes for questions. Thank you so much, Alexander. We indeed do have a little bit of time for questions, so uh, see a hand up there. Well, um, based on everything you say, have you seen one project that has done the, the right thing that, that you see, well, okay, this is uh, how it should be, uh, or, and this is... No, uh, no, absolutely not. <laughs> no. However, None. however, absolutely not, but, but I'm not, I'm, I'm still an enthusiast, right? Okay. Because what we're dealing with here who here was born uh, before 1890? No, anybody? No. <laughs> the the first um, the first applications of telephony were horrible, and people who played with all you know the first telephone connections were like, "Why do we need this? We can just walk over to this guy's house," because they didn't even go long distance, right? They, they solved no issue. They were horribly, um, you know, bad to use, hissing, you know, uh, noise, etc. And so you stand there in front of the first telephone, you're like, this is radical shit. <laughs> Who would ever come up with this, right? And look where we're now. So, so that's why it's, it's just not time yet. We'll get there. Okay, can I rephrase my question then? Are there any initiatives where you see, okay, these are... Uh, asking themselves the right questions and... Well, um, you can come and talk to me about what I'm doing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, let's talk, yeah. Chill, I have chill. Also, uh, <laughs> um, but um, there's a couple of obscure ones that I think, um, that I think are on the right track. Uh, I don't know, um, my favorite project of all crypto and blockchain is Urbit. Who here knows Urbit? few people. Urbit is Alpha Centauri technology dictated by, by a channeler. I, I don't know where it came from. <laughs> but, but, but it's actually the thinking behind it, if you ignore most of the c computer stack, is, <laughs> is actually really amazingly solid. And it's about um, gradual decentralization. Jamie was talking about that too, and I agree. I think radical decentralization is, is insane, and gradual decentralization is how we need to do it. And there's a few there's a few people that are doing it that way. Uh, uh, I mean, I have to think. I, I like a, a ton. I, I I'm a big fan of a couple of projects, but it's not to say that they're doing the right thing yet. So. Can't 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 really talk about former portfolio companies. <laughs> There's a question up there. Yep, yeah, go ahead. Um, I really liked it, especially that you introduced the people's perspective with incentives. But 
what do you think about social or value incentives? Because at least from for me as an outsider, I see the blockchain community as a group of people who are really in it for the values. They're convinced by this, right? Yeah. So yeah. how is this affecting the decision making of the people involved in all of these projects? How is what affecting it? Sorry. The, the values that the people stand for. I mean, that's also obviously going to impact their decision well, making. Well, I think, so, so look, um, I, have a, I started a campaign that's called uh, Hug a Bitcoin Maximalist. <laughs> The reason why why I say that is because if if a if a sane person in 2008 were to look at Bitcoin, they'd say this is absolutely insane. I could never do this. But but Bitcoin community, with its values, came out and said, no, this is great, and they they were the first adopters of this, and 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 through them it came out to the larger circles, right? In my view the value of the social uh, and political views of the radical decentralization community, that's their importance, is that they're not afraid to lose all, all of their money to prove a point, right? But I don't think they're right. <laughs> Thank them, but, but that's it. All right, one last question. Please raise your hand so we can bring you the mic. Oh, there you go. Can you bring um, it? Yeah, oh, right, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you mentioned, um, like, you talked about the users at some point. Yeah. And that if they're not adopting your project, it's, be oh, uh, it's because they're stupid. I agree. <laughs> um, I'm a UX designer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I was wondering, uh, what what is it, in your opinion, in specifically in terms of UX and design, what, what are the problems that designers should be solving in order to increase adoption? Well, I, I don't think it's it's actually not something that the designer can quite do yet um, because the technology is still so fragmented. But if you, Josh, how many, how successful are you at uh, buying buying dye? I, I made it happen. You what? I made it happen. You made it happen. How many different things did you have to load, access, or read? Like, just give me a number of concepts you had to digest in the Not process. Many, but I had to iterate many times. So, so my answer is too fragmented, uh, key management is shit, um, and just no good kind of supportive information. And, and, then, and then when it gets less fragmented, that's when the designer can come in and make it even better, I think. 